the news agents. No country has been known to ever recover from long-term low birth rates. So if we think this is going to lead to some blissful state where we're going to get down to maybe one, two billion and life will be blissful, it's not that. We're tail spinning down with no examples of how to get out of this. So that's nice and cheery then. For the last 200 years, the world population has been growing. But in a couple of decades' time, we are expecting that to peak. You just heard from one demographer there, Stephen J. Shaw, spelling out how bad things could get. Today, we're going to ask why we're no longer having enough babies to regenerate the global population. And we're also going to explore how this whole subject has been co-opted by parts of the hard right. Welcome to the News Agents. It's Emily. There's no John. <laughs> There's no Lewis. But we do have Elon Musk, Jordan Peterson and Jacob Rees-Mogg. Let's hear them. I think one of the biggest risks to civilization is the low birth rate and the rapidly declining birth rate. If people don't have more children, civilization is going to crumble. Mark my words. Well, I've thought for at least 10 years that the biggest problem in 50 years will be that there's just not enough people. This idea that the planet has too many people on it, this is, I, there's no sentiment more implicitly genocidal than that statement. If we want a, an economy that can tackle climate change, we need more children. And I've done my bit by having six, so now let me encourage you to do yours. The more children, the merrier. Those three men, they've had 19 kids between them. And, as you heard, they wish everyone else would do the same. You don't have to be on the right to take this issue seriously. Plenty of neutral scientists and academics can also spell out the data that's pretty much staring us in the face. But we should perhaps be curious about why the right, the hard right, seem especially keen to adopt and discuss pro-natalist policies. We'll come on to that a little bit later. Let's start, though, with what we know, which is that fertility rates are falling worldwide. In Japan, in China, in South Korea, the number of babies being born now is way, way below the replacement rate, the rate, in other words, necessary to allow for the younger generation to provide economically and physically for the older one. Since 2013, a quarter of Japan's population has been over 65. And in the coming years that same stat will be true of Finland, of Germany, of Italy and Portugal. How will older societies function if there just aren't enough young? And should we solve the problem with tax incentives or with immigration? Can you encourage people to give birth or has society simply changed too much to go backwards? And is there any upside to a world with fewer people? Does it put less pressure on resources, give everyone a bit more room. Well, let's start with our first guest, Robert Colville, who is the Director for Centre of Policy Studies and has written extensively about this issue. So we have this idea that the world is a crowded, teeming place and that we are, we are sort of busy stripping it bare. And that's actually increasingly outdated. What happens as, as, as people become richer, they tend to have fewer children. And what we're seeing is uh, by the end of the century, The Lancet says, in 97% of countries, they will be below the replacement rate. It basically, you can keep the population steady if you're if you're having two point one children per per woman, and um, so ninety seven percent of countries are going to be below that. Um, Britain, for example, is already at one point five. South Korea notoriously is at around sort of zero point eight territory. Is um, that the lowest in the world? Uh, I think it's one of the lowest in the world. Yes, um, but and you can see how this is going to be utterly transformative for the the shape and nature of humanity. So at the moment. India, China, and Africa are all roughly equal on 1.4 billion people. That's you know those are the, so that's where the the bulk of humanity is. By the end of the century, on on current trends, uh, China will be almost half as large. Uh, China will be about 800 million people. India will have grown a bit, then shrunk a bit, and probably be about 1.5. But the the growth area, in every sense, is going to be Africa, where they expect the population to be a, around 4.2 billion, 4 billion. You know, it's obviously very, very uncertain. But but essentially, by that time, more than half of all the children being born in the world are going to be born in sub-Saharan Africa. So so we are going to become it, it sort of almost an African species as, as time goes by, because that's where the weight of numbers is going to be. And what do you do if you are in South Korea? I mean, what are they doing now? Well, so this is one of the, the interesting things. In a load of countries, 
people are starting to talk about pronatal policy, which just means persuading people to have more children, almost in the way they do about defence policy. They're be- beginning to sort of think of it as a kind of as a national security issue. Um, I should say at the start that like there's not a lot of good evidence that you can really turn the tide on this. That you know the 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 Lancet study says that there you know it will give a small boost to fertility rates, but this there is this sort of great big tide of shrinking fertility that is that it's affecting everyone. But um, I, South Korea, I'm not that familiar with their policies. But for example, in Hungary, they say they are now spending 4.3 percent of GDP to support families. In France and Germany, uh, Germany is now giving you uh, one grand per child per year for 10 years to help young couples buy a home. France already gives massive tax breaks to families with children, massive deductions for, for uh, in day-to-day life. And is and Emmanuel Macron is saying that isn't enough. We need a demographic rearmament. So this cuts across the political persuasions of countries, right? This This is not... I mean, if you say Victor Orban, you think of a sort of, uh, you know, yeah, a, yes. a conservative, yeah, or Georgia hard right in Italy, sort yeah. of, you know, um, policy. But you're saying this happens in France, this happens in Germany, this happens in sort of broadly socialist led. Yeah, it happens, it happens well. in America. I mean, one of the interesting things about Britain is, and we've highlighted this in our, in our policy work, is we are very, very unusual in, in our tax system, for example, in that we don't actually do much to support families. I mean, I we, mean have, we, we did the opposite. George yeah. Osborne memorably cut child support after the second child. Yes, and and so there's a, there's a, there's a cap, there's a welfare cap for people who have more children, but also we mean to test child benefit for um, if you're a high earner, you don't get much support. If you earn over 100k, you don't get any child support. So we do we tend to do our child care support by by benefits. But if you look at most other countries, essentially, once you have kids, the government goes, well, that's a that's a really big cost to you, and we're quite keen for you to have kids, so we will we will cut your taxes. Um, and we don't do that. And we, we're also very, very hostile in particular to single earner couples. So um, if you have two people in a couple earning £40,000 each, they will be taxed at a far lower rate than a couple where one of you is earning 80k, even though you've got the same amount of money mm. to, to, to play with. So if you're on your own and want to have a kid, there's far less incentive for you to do so. Yes. And also, I mean, as, as I think every, all of your listeners will know, we we've created a system a sort of economic system where in order to afford a house mm. you you basically need two salaries it's really 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 hard to get on the property ladder certainly in london and the southeast if you're a, if you're a single parent in fact we've we've created a system which is almost uniquely disadvantageous to having kids why do you think i mean do you think that has been uh just an error or do you think there is a sense of you know we're a tiny island teeming with people as you said and everyone needs more space so we don't really care if people have fewer children here it's unarguable that we failed to build enough houses since about 1955. We are four million houses down on the European average. Like we, so it's just there's just Terrible. a lot less space for people to go into. But yeah, we we I think there's 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 a lingering suspicion of a lot, a lot of people who talk like this sound like they're talking from the 1950s or even from from earlier periods. There's that kind of the um, the Germans had that slogan, you know, Kinder, Kirche, Kuka, you know, that a woman's place was you know church, family, and, it's anti progress, uh, and, and yeah, and uh, yeah, and. So I think, that, but what a lot of people now, especially on the left, are arguing is something slightly different, which is that if you look at Britain and most other Western countries, the number of children, pe- lots of people don't want to have kids, and that's fine. Like no one should be saying you, you, you should do your demographic duty. You need you to breed for Britain. No one should say that. But in a lot of countries, the number of children people say they want is still around. It's still like the classic two point four families. Mm-hmm. Like men and women both say, in an ideal world, I want to have children and I want to have a you know I want to have a family, and they are ending up having basically in this country like what on average one fewer child than they want to or hope okay to. so that's interesting so it should the should the sort of tax incentives or the economic incentives or whatever or, or the cultural incentives be for women who've already chosen that they do want families but they might want to have three rather than two or four rather than three i mean is that where you think the sort of the gap is that I, I think most of the evidence yeah it, it's not people having or not having children it's, yeah. it's people who do want to have children having them later and having them fewer I mean even I mean there's all sorts of fascinating stuff like this even things like seatbelt laws like we put in laws saying children have to have child seats like as a parent I'm quite happy that my children have child seats yeah. and they're not going to die in a crash but suddenly that means that you can basically only fit two seats in a car and they've they've looked they've, they've, they've done research on this and found that there is a measurable impact from people going from having three kids to two kids because the expense of getting a a, a car large enough to have three kids is, I, I is could, quite I'd a literally, significant one. I, I could literally tell you one of my close friends who, when he'd had kids and I hadn't, said, we've got the Mini and it's perfect for two. You know, two in the back, two in the front, and that's how you sort of envisage 
you know, your family car, your family life, right? Yeah, and but but also just obviously like you know, getting extra bedroom space is is is, pre- yeah. is pretty tough, and also childcare is is ex- we, we we have created one of the most expensive. Even though we do subsidise it heavily, we've cre- still created an extraordinarily expensive childcare system. So I guess I'm 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 still confused by mm. whether you believe that pronatalist economic policies does turn this around or not. I, I mean, think, if it doesn't, it doesn't really matter whether you give people better tax breaks or, or cheaper childcare. You know, fundamentally, if more if more people are choosing not to have children or not to have as many children, mm, that's that's it. I don't think there's much evidence that you, that these kind of policies get us back to a land where we have more, we, where we have loads and loads of workers, fewer pensioners, that the demographic pyramid suddenly looks great, we can afford the welfare state forever, mm. all that kind of stuff. But I do think they could, could help because these, these, are, these effects are, are, are extraordinary because every, every sort of small increase in fertility does, does have huge ramifications down the line. I mean, if you look at the population projections at the moment, if we go to net zero immigration, the government is projecting that we'll end up, you know, we'll end up, the population in the UK will fall to about 45 million. If we continue with net migration on the way we got, we'll be at sort of 88 million. Like these are, the, the you know, the size of the population is like the huge, one of, and the amount of immigration we have, the amount of kids we have, where those kids are. You know, already we've got primary schools which are closing. It will Wait do, a second, so what will, you're saying is we're damned if we don't, but we're also damned if we do. Yeah. Yeah, well, on immigration. I mean, at, at the moment, we are, we effectively operate a, a Ponzi scheme that we have a an a, a, a an ever smaller working population and an ever larger pensioner population because and that's a that's a good thing because we're all living longer. We've got medical advances. We've got you know people are people are, yeah. are active into into all these. But the number of people who are having to pay for the elderly and their care, you know, we don't. Everyone says I've paid in. You you haven't paid in. You've paid for the generation above you and the generation after you will pay for you. So. Either we say we need workers; they've got to come from, you know, people having children or, or, or immigration, or we say we're just we're going to be happy for the population to shrink. But then that means that we're not going to be able to afford a lot of the things we've we, we've told ourselves we can afford. And these are huge, big questions with no easy answers. And it interacts with the kind of lives people want to lead with their families. It interacts with the shape of the welfare state. It interacts with you know what the tax burden is, what, what growth rates are. It's it it's so so key to what kind of country we are, and we just don't really think about it that much. <laughs> you talked about the the you know the sort of nineteen thirties slogan "Kinder Kirka Kuka." I mean, there is a there is a wing right now of the Conservative Party who are very family focused you know if you listen to Danny Kruger if you listen to Miriam Cates Jacob Rees-Mogg um they are extolling the virtues of the larger family and Jacob Rees-Mogg is living those values very much so I mean at what point do you start saying this is not actually a statistical discussion about the size of the country this is about I guess something a bit darker which is sort of you know preserving a pristine looking Britain that doesn't need outsiders in it. So I don't think we're at that space. And I think, I mean, I, I think there are obviously... People so I said who pristine, feel, obviously, yeah. in kind of inverted commas. Yeah. Or not, yeah. No, so I think, I, I don't think it's just a statistical discussion, but I don't think it's about, I don't think it's a sort of a, a racial or racist di- discussion. I think the the best way to look at it is, is about people leading, being able to lead the kind of lives they they want to lead. But then they would surely talk about you know um, adoption for gay couples and you know same sex couples having children. You don't you never hear that, do you? We could have a whole separate conversation about the the horrors of our foster care system and the desperate need for people to become foster parents and the mm. the, the appalling rates at which people are rejected who 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 do come forward. For, forward for fostering or the appalling rates at which expressions of interest don't turn into fostering that is definitely a, a, a huge issue but I think but the other issue that we haven't talked but about that's is, a very yeah. separate issue yeah. Yeah. But just actually, saying yeah. we're going to make you know surrogacy easier we're going to make it easier in well, our I, laws I, for, I, for IVF is another, is another area of, of course of about this and how much because that's a really expensive procedure but it's it can be life changing for the, for the people who get it and of course the other area that you, that comes out in this is marriage i think one of the the fault lines in this is whether you sort of think that people should be having more children and they should be married mm. or whether you just think people should be having more 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 children and i think that's a there, there is a divide on that um, within the conservative party and with, within the country as a whole what do you think is going to happen to us I think we will continue with um, pretty high levels of immigration, um, and uh, the, uh, the the population will sort of will level out. We will end up with 
a I mean a, a much larger elderly population it will, and we will we will struggle to to afford that and we will have I mean just this this week it's really interesting just this week you know the government has said the triple lock is safe for another decade and mm-hmm. you you wouldn't bet on on labor changing that but that's a that's a huge commitment we we've effectively structured our state to support pensioners rather than workers and almost every decision that's that we make seems to be tilted in that direction and one of the reasons that it's so tough for for working families is precisely because we've chosen to Say, look, actually, it's you know, it's the NHS which should get um, get the money. It's um, the triple lock which should get should get the money. And I think there's a growing sense that that's that's unfair. But the other aspect of this, of course, is that pensioners vote. There are loads of pensioners. They are much more likely to vote. The average pensioner vote eighty percent of pensioners will vote versus roughly fifty percent of twenty somethings. So you know, we we carried out some analysis that in a majority by the next election, in a majority of constituencies, the majority of voters will be fifty five or older. So we are you know, we're becoming quite quite a gerontocratic society. Robert, really interesting to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to talk now to Stephen J. Shaw. He's a demographer who's made a documentary called The Birth Gap. And Stephen, we've started to explore what's happening Do you understand why? Until I started researching this eight years ago, there was a sense that it was to do with local problems. There was a local problem in Japan to do with work-life balance, a local problem in Italy to do with high youth unemployment. It turns out there is a common reason. It's to do with delayed parenthood. We see the same patterns across every single nation where there's data available that shows that as time has gone by, people tend to start having children later and later. And that has resulted in a high level of what I term unplanned childlessness. So you're treating it as if it's a mistake. I think there's a lack of awareness. The reality is from surveys, deep surveys, we can see that 90 to 95 percent of young women during their fertile years either have or want children. The reality is that today the UK is heading for a situation where only 65% of women will ever have a child. So there's a huge gap. I would hate to use the word mistake. I think it's just lack of awareness of what can happen in life. Let's play you some of our listeners. These are people who wrote in, uh, had things to say about it. So maybe, you know, this is anecdotal rather than statistical, but it's worth hearing some of those voices. Sure. There are several reasons I could give to justify my choice not to have children. Financial, environmental impact, physical, mental health being common ones. I've been told it's a waste, I won't be a mother, that it's what women are supposed to do, that I'm selfish and prioritise myself and my career. I view having children to be a choice, not an obligation, necessity or an inevitability as a woman. And it's certainly not a safety net for when I'm too old to care for myself. Despite earning a pretty good wage, I have no intention of having kids due to the financial burden that no, children have on families. I think realistically my options are have kids or retire. To think I can do both is a bit too naive, even for me. The primary reason I didn't want to have children is because of the housing crisis. I recently worked out that the average London house price in a good condition is roughly about seven times my salary and that's just for something like a small two-birth flat in about zone three nothing luxurious i just don't know how you're expected to bring children up when we don't have good secure housing in this country we're a generation that's unlikely to buy a home and we need that to provide a stable home to build a family alongside the additional costs of childcare, which is around a thousand pound a month plus all the additional elements that come with a child, another mouth to feed, clothes, trips, would be a constant struggle, we would feel, to make ends meet with the existing cost of living crisis. I've never really had the desire to have children and I like my life how it is with my freedom. I know I would love a child that I would have, but I know that I wouldn't love my life and that's enough of a reason for me to be confident in my choice. I also cannot fathom how I would ever be able to afford to have a family, even though I work full time, without having to make financial sacrifices. Those are definitely not people who have just seen life go by without them. They're people who have all made a deliberate choice for varying reasons, many of them economic, we must say, to not have children. Yes. So that exists and we have to, as a society, accept that. I think there's a real divide between those people who simply never have the desire to have a child, who perhaps can't often understand those who do, and certainly vice versa. 
Um, and I, I would have to say that you know, I wouldn't want to live in a country, in, on a planet, where we coerce people who don't want to be parents, to become parents, mm. to, to do so. So I hear those comments. They are the minority, though. They're a significant minority. Um, you know, the vast majority of people who have not had children had planned to have a ch child one day. And they're not out in the streets protesting, making comments. They're quietly sitting in their homes, trying to get on with their lives, talking of what they term the grief of not having the family that they dream to have. I mean, we don't know, do we, how many people are sitting at home sort of mourning their grief of not well, having a Well, I think it's very child. clear. You know, if you go back, for example, to Italy and the UK and Japan around 1973, childlessness was less than 10%, around 5 6%, and then suddenly changed within three years of the oil shock to 25%, 30 35%. This was, a, this was a baby shock. It wasn't some demographic trend that slowly crept into societies. This was an overnight black and white. And, they, and if you look underneath that data, you see what happened happened, people who already had a child, mothers, continued having the same number of children as always before. So some data. Last year in the UK, mothers were having on average 2.3 children. That's the same as 1970. The rate of children that mothers are having has not changed in 50 years. Here or Japan, it's actually gone up a little bit in the US. So motherhood is incredibly strong. What has happened is through these shocks and through these delays, we can clearly correlate that this is people hoping to have a child who often run out of time. And that is often driven by not having a partner. Biology is only one element here. The thing you have heard repeatedly in the clips that we played is people talking about the economic cost. I mean, that surely is the thing that has to change before people are going to willingly embark on a journey which is going to be costly, difficult, you know, exhausting at times and leave them poorer. I mean, if you manage to give people the sense that they will afford a house for their children, that they will afford, you know, to have space for their children, that they can afford to give their children trips and education, all the rest of it, then they might be more willing to contemplate it. You would think so, but if you go to Japan where I live, mortgage rates have been 0.3% for decades now. I've never heard a young Japanese couple say that they can't afford a house at all. They might complain about the cost of education, which is expensive there. But then you go to Denmark or Germany where education is free, and you have, in the case of Denmark, one year paid maternity or combined maternity leave. So there's always exceptions. And what you actually find is when you put money in people's pockets, young people, people, typically what tends to happen is they say, OK, well, now we can have a few holidays. Now we can spend a few years. And then they get to a point where they're ready, but biology is against them or there's a breakup or a divorce. So or there's a choice or there's a choice. They just say, I live a pretty emancipated life. I have a career I love. I go on trips when I want to. And I've chosen not to have children. I mean, m maybe we have to acknowledge that and accept that this is this is progress this is emancipation i could not agree more with you uh, and a, a lot of the work i do is sharing with people that we have to understand that not everyone wants a child and the great news is in terms of our low birth rates if the people who want to have a child and it is around nine, there was a survey at the end of last year in the uk 1500 young women aged 18 to 35 92.4% either had a child or wanted a child. Only 7.6% did not want a child. If those people who wanted a child had the number of children they want to have, we wouldn't have a birth rate crisis. So the focus needs to go on those people who are not able to have the children that they want to have. And you would presumably then want it to be much more easy for same-sex couples to have children as well. Yeah, in the documentary I made, I interviewed actually more than one same-sex couple who had gone through the pains of adopting or the challenges of surrogacy, which is a very complex subject. I don't take any moral views. All I care about is those people who want to have child, a child, that they're able to do so. Why do you think that this argument or this... Um, line of discussion, I guess we broadly call it pronatalist, is so readily co-opted by authoritarian regimes or by the right wing. I mean, why do you think it's become this sort of talking point in the government of Viktor Orban in Hungary on the sort of hard right of the Conservative Party here? Is there something that you feel that doesn't just speak to demographics, that speaks to 
something slightly more sinister? Well, I've said I will never involve myself with anything that is sinister, anything coercive. But you, your point is a good one. For example, I've done a lot of interviews around the world, and it tends to be either... Uh, I was delighted to meet you today. It tends to be often being interviewed by men, often interviewed by more conservative channels. Why is that? This affects everybody, left and right. Those people who want a child and are not having children are both on the left wing, the centre and the right. It may turn out to be that the policies that are being put in place, perhaps in Japan, maybe even in Hungary, which are just making it more perhaps in some way achievable for people to have the children they want to have. Maybe we will all be looking at them in future for those policies saying that's interesting, they got something right. I'm guessing you you know why you talk to, you know, more men on the right about this or, you know, why governments like Viktor Orban's um, tend to endorse this is because... There is often, with pronatalism, an undercurrent of white supremacy. It's about keeping your nation, the colour, the shape, the culture, the religion, that you want it. I mean, Orban has made virtually <laughs> no disguise of that in Hungary. Does that leave you uncomfortable? Well, I live in Japan, so I think we'd have to substitute at least white supremacy for perhaps nations who, in some way... Uh, care for their culture in a, perhaps a different way to others. I don't get involved in that discussion. It's up to individual nations to decide what is right for them. I will not say I don't have an opinion on immigration. I can give you an opinion in terms of the impact of immigration, in terms of how it will play out mathematically, in terms of the dem dem demography. Well, let's talk about yeah. Japan and immigration, because Japan's had a very clear anti-immigrant sort of position. It opts for robots rather than immigrants, right, to sort of do the, the jobs. I mean, is that a place that you think more countries will go with pronatalist policies? And are you are you comfortable with a nation that says no immigration? The perception of immigration in Japan is slightly outdated. It is opening up slowly through necessity. They cannot find people to work in the convenience stores. To, 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 they had to recently cancel the trolley service on their famous Shinkansen trains because they can't get workers. It's starting to bite. Am I comfortable? Well, I will say this. When I travel around the world, the reason I enjoy visiting countries is because I like different cultures. I think it would be very sad if we end up with a planet with some form of monoculture where everything's the same everywhere. I think it, therefore it becomes quite harsh to criticize those nations who tend to take a different stance to some others in terms of how they look to look after their culture. Um, because you think that inviting immigrants in what fundamentally takes that culture away? Well, let me talk about it from a demographic point of view, which is where I'm comfortable. You know, what often happens is people look at low birth rates and say, well, you know, the reason Japan has a problem is because with birth rates is they're not making up for the birth that they're not having through immigration mm -hmm. in the same way other countries are. Arguably, the UK is doing that, that, that now. But these are two different conversations because you still end up with the same problem. If you look at nations that have gone through long-term policies of immigration, whether it be Italy, whether it be Germany, here in the UK, you still have fundamentally low birth rates. Now, the immigrants who come need to be cared for through their old age. So the number of old people will stay the same. The pressure and cost of the NHS will stay the same. Birth rates remain low, however, that's what happens. So you then need more immigrants and then you then need more and more and more. So you're looking at perpetual immigration as a policy. But we're now in a world where almost every country by the end of this century will be below replacement rate. The number of babies being born in India peaked in 2001. They're now down by 20 percent. India is already on the same path that Japan, Italy and indeed the UK are now following. So the idea that there will be this mass pool of available immigrants in perpetuity is false. Because we're going to peak. Even the African countries, the Sahel countries are going to peak on birth rates and then it's going to start coming down. That's right. So I guess I guess the bigger question then is maybe we just have to get used to this. Maybe we have to say that we will be taking up fewer resources, you know, on Earth. We will be finding there is more room. I say we, obviously, you know, many of us won't exist in that time. But that we have to get used to a world in which there are fewer people. 
Well, we are going to have to get used to that, even if birth rates, say, in Japan... Went and environmentalists, you know, many people would say not such a terrible thing. No country has been known to ever recover from long-term low birth rates. So if we think this is going to lead to some blissful state where we're going to get down to maybe one, two billion and life will be blissful, it's not that. We're tail spinning down with no examples of how to get out of this. Well, well paint me the picture then of, of what happens if the birth rates don't come up. So you're talking about societies with decaying communities, closed down schools, areas where you have desolation, but some people still living there, particularly old people. You're talking of NHS costs or the equivalent healthcare system that cannot be maintained at current levels because you don't have enough workers to maintain those elderly people. But I guess and that happens once, right? That is that is a horrendous shock. Let's call that, you know, an extinction level event for, you know, for that generation. But after that, if you've already accepted that maybe, you know, five in 10 people don't have children, then doesn't that adapt? No, and this is the thing. It's not a one-time shock. It's a perpetual decline forever. So even the next generation, there will be at some point in time, fewer older people, but again, because of fewer parents, you'll have even fewer children and then even fewer children again. And this spiral never ends until, well, we're not going to go extinct. What will happen is some new subculture that does prioritize having family will quite rapidly grow and will become the predominant culture of each each nation. And is that the thing that worries people like Viktor Orban? I mean, you've heard of this, you know, this idea of the great replacement theory. You know, they're coming to get us. They're taking over our culture. You know, is that is that the concern that actually, you know, whether it's African nations, whether it's um, you know the subcontinent, whether it's China that they will have bigger families, that there will be more of them. And so that's why Europeans are now sort of, you know, panicking in their skin that it's going to be a cultural replacement. I mean, do you think that is intellectually at the bottom of, of the fear of autocrats like Orban? I would turn it around. I would think the theory that you can solve the low birth rate crisis by immigration alone is very short-sighted because immigrants need looked after when they get older yeah. and therefore you need more immigrants. So you end up with the same problem. But I'm not even talking solution. about immigration. I'm just talking about some countries, you know, having bigger populations than other countries. And then you, you think that that's where the power of the world is weighted. Is that the worry? I've never met Viktor Orban, so I certainly wouldn't want to speak for what's driving him. But I've been to Hungary several times. I've spoken at events there, family focused events. And I find just people who care about society at large, care about each other, care about single parents, care about the elderly. I've never felt anything negative or oppressive in, in anything I've been doing in, in Hungary. So that would go against you know, my, my own personal experience mm. there. Mm. But let's remember, as we sit here in the UK today, if current teenagers have the same number of children at the same time as current 20, 30 and 40 year olds, 35% of UK teenagers will end up childless. And the majority of those, probably one in four UK people will be childless, not by choice. Okay. Well, and that's a core talk, issue. Talk to me about the solutions then, um, as we sort of, you know, wrap up here. You'd agree, you cannot co coerce women who are making choices about their own lives to have children. Correct. You can probably incentivize couples who think it's too expensive to have children to find economic means of making that more easy. You know, the economic side is, is very complicated. And frankly, I'm, I'm always a little bit skeptical when people blame finances. If you go back two generations, three generations, we were a lot poorer and yet having children wasn't such a problem. And people point to the housing crisis, which is real and does affect people. But it seems to be when people find that right partner, very often they find a way. And it might be a case of a smaller home than expected. It might be a case of even living with extended family for a time. If people meet each other and want a family, very often it happens. The solution for me is when I look into the eyes of younger people, I mean from age 12 to 24 forming their lives, who are realizing what has perhaps happened to the generation above them, who have gone through life in the belief that they, after studying hard, after working hard, that they would then have the family they dream to have. And when they realize that that might not happen, I think what may happen is more and more younger people will say, wait a minute, I just need to resequence things here. And then society needs to be much more flexible. So you and open think that, that the young just aren't actually meeting their partners? No, that's that's absolutely clear. 
and meeting a partner in one's 30s is not any easier than meeting a partner in the 20s. And very often today you find people single in their 30s trying to find that person. But your life's already formed in your 30s. You know where you want to live. You know your friend group. You know where you like to have vacations. You need to find that perfect match that fits your lifestyle. Whereas meeting someone in one's 30s... And why 20s, is it so much harder now to, to meet people? I think it probably always has been harder in, in, in the 30s. I think the shift for us to have a series of what might be temporary relationships or fragile relationships in our 20s in the hope that you know both people are ready in the 30s. I, I, I think just th this delaying of finding a partner in itself is a problem. And then people say- you're, so you're talking about delaying as if it was a choice. I mean, if people don't find their partner, they don't find their partner. I guess I'm asking why they're not. I think there isn't an urgency to find partners. I think the, the societal norm today, the average age, I believe a person's having a child in the UK, I believe it's 31 or 32. So if you're a 16, 18 year old at high school, you're not looking at your high school classmates thinking this might be the person I, I marry and have a child with at all. That's that's a, that's another lifetime away. And that's presumably because of longevity, right? I mean, if you, Partly, yes. you, know, if you think you're going to make it to 100, um, getting married at 20 is... Boy, yes. that's a long old marriage. Yes. And the reality, though, is that biology's longevity has not increased in the same way longevity elsewhere uh, increased. So for those people who want children, this is this is not an easy you know, set circumstance to, to solve. But what I'm saying, I, I equate it to musical chairs. And I think up till now, the musical chairs that we've been focused on in our 20s is the career musical chairs. I want to get that position, that company. I want to get that promotion until I'm ready. What we often haven't realized is there's another set of, mus uh, of musical chairs, which is finding a partner at the right time to have a child. and. You know, those both exist. And I think society as a whole has to become much more flexible career wise, education wise, to allow those people who want to have a child at a younger age to do so. And we don't. And we don't. Stephen Jewell, great to speak to you. Thanks very much for Thank coming. Thank you very in. much. Right. What more do you need to know before we go? Well, tomorrow we have what has been billed as the Maundy Thursday Q&A special. And if that's not a sexy title, I don't know what is. We'll be back, all three of us, answering your questions to the very best of our limited ability. We'll see you then. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 